once more <coughs> as we come into your homes. I pray that it's uh, it's kind of like prayer. It's it's more than in your home. It's that you allow the word of God to come to your heart and to your soul and to your very being. I pray that as we come into the Word, that it's, I have a two-part message, and, and that I'm not even certain of. I've entitled today's message, uh, The Foundation of Trust. And I could go into a whole lot of things in, about where the foundation of each one lies, but the Lord led me to the book of Daniel, and most people, if you just ask them, what the book of Daniel is about, almost everyone would just, if they know any Bible at all, would say Daniel's about Daniel and the lion's den. Well, that is partially right. That is, in fact, that is 100% true. But Daniel's more about Daniel than in the lion's den. In fact, if you want a little bit of I guess numbers, and don't don't hold these in your mind. Don't don't even take up that space. This is one of them vapors that are just going to be here for a while and just let it filter on back. God in His infinite wisdom in Daniel, there's 365 verses leading up into the lion's den. There's two verses of Daniel actually in the den. So God's more important, or God is more concerned about everyday life. Day to day, and sometimes even monotonous, waking up, going about your day, whatever that day might be, then He is, now He's concerned when we're the den. When we're being tried by lions, whatever your lion might be. But where is our foundation? Where is my foundation? Where is it? My spiritual foundation. Where is it? And you won't know that. Oh, you, I've heard many brag about it when the mortgage is paid and all four tires is up in their cars. But when it gets down when you're in the den, where's your two verses? Holy Spirit, 365 of just everyday life, going about his life. I thought that was marvelous. But only spoke two. I want to read the story again of Daniel in the lion's den. Remember, Daniel was probably 85 or 90 years old now. I've seen pictures of artists as they place Daniel in the lion's den. It's a young teenager. Wrong truth. In fact, zero truth. Daniel's an old man now. Probably looks like a hermit. Let's listen. You can follow along if you want. It's found in Daniel 6. In fact, Topic simply says, Daniel in the den of lions. It pleased Darius, that's the king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them. One of them, who was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself from among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptionary qualities and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charge against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel 
unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the, den, into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue a decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king. <laughs> or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, and according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edit that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they bound Daniel and threw him to the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the dead, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the ring of the nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, and without any entertainment, being brought unto him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an astonished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels, and he shut the mouth of the lions, and they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the dead, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, what a precious, precious sacred scripture, Lord, that you have preserved. And so many times, Lord, we as a body and we as a nation, we as believers, Lord, look past all the others and we just see the lions and see Daniel. But this morning, O oh Lord, I pray that we see you, our Father. That we see you in when we are in the den, Lord. When we are in that uncertain times and we are being challenged on all fronts. So Lord, may our hearts and our minds and our souls be tender this morning. May we set aside all worries of tomorrow, concerns of yesterday. And may we simply allow the Holy Spirit just to move in our midst. My Father, use now my weakness, that I too, Lord, might just simply trust in you, 
May the words that I speak, Lord, be your words, your truth, and your gospel. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. The foundation of trust. When we began to release our security of whatever that might be throughout the world, and, there, and there's nothing wrong in and of itself of having security. I know when I come home at night or when I get in my car or my, my old truck or something, I, I find security in that from the storms. The other, the other week I went and, and, and uh, picked up someone who was uh, hung up and when I shut the door and the truck had been sitting there out and pecking and banging, when I got in, it was nice and warm. There's nothing wrong with grasping that. But when we release that, just picture within your mind just releasing that and grasping God's eternal and security hand for what the future holds. And the future will always be uncertain to human mind. But I know without a doubt because of Scripture and because of Jesus and because of He is Emmanuel, God with us, that God is faithful no matter what the future holds. Never forget that you're not just simply blinding following Jesus the Christ. We're not simply just trusting Him and say, Lord, just whatever by chance happens, I'm still following you. It, it's not that way at all. God wants us to trust Him because He longs to be in your heart and in your soul. That's the difference. Trust, in fact, is the foundation of almost any long-term relationship. You can just pick a business and there has to be trust between employee and employers. You can pick a foundation of, of any establishment and there's trust there. There's trust in parenting. There's trust in grandparenting. Trust is actually the keynote upon which any long-term establishment exists. And yet trust in God simply does not come naturally. Trust in God and if you've been a Christian for very long, simply does not come easily. It must be learned. It must be received from God. I, I still smile. You've heard me say this many times of young teenagers saying they're trying to find themselves or, or maybe, uh, I don't know if they still call it puppy love or not, but uh, they found that first love. But trusting God is not finding. Trusting God is receiving. Because when you begin to receive the word, then a trust in God also must be exercised. Picture with me, if you would, just for a moment, as trust in God and that foundation of God as, as a muscle. Now, everyone knows that muscles can be taught. And muscles learn by repetitive action. Any instrument that is played, regardless of what it is, is learned by repetitive action. And there must be an exercise freely each and every moment of every day to exercise that muscle of trust. That we begin to trust Jesus for even the littlest and tiniest of things. But like a muscle that grows with use, Muscles also decrease when we no longer trust a man called Jesus. So muscles of trust need to be used each and every day, just every day of our life. One cannot simply will oneself to trust Jesus. One can't be like a little two-year-old that just goes and he said, I'm going to will myself. And we hear that so often in the world today. We'll just trust in it. And it just flows off the tip of our tongues. You know, just like saying, we just, just will it to yourself. It, it can't happen. 
what is within us and what God instilled in us at creation when he created us in the image of him. He created in us the power to pay attention to the faithfulness of Jesus. If we look at Jesus, the Christ, throughout his life, and I, I heard a song this week was about Jesus in the tomb. And for three days, everyone thought Jesus was dead. And it was a fairly long song, and it was sang by a really good, I don't remember, was the Isaacs, maybe. But the lyrics of the song in Justice says, what about the leopard that Jesus cleansed? Did his spots return on the tomb of sin? What about the blind man that Jesus gave sight to? Did darkness return when darkness entered the tomb? And it goes on and on about the lady that touched him and about the death and, and the lame. He said, for the three days when darkness was in the tomb, did their light still shine? Did we still trust Jesus in our darkest hour? We need to pay attention throughout our life that, and through our journey that the faithfulness of Jesus never wavered. Throughout as he made his way into the cross and even as someone else had to carry their cross. Someone else might have to carry your cross. You carried my cross for many, many, many months. But when we embrace the uncertainty of this new year that is about to be upon us, and when we grasp God's eternal hand through Jesus the Christ, God's going to give us opportunity after opportunity to exercise that muscle of trust. He's going to give us opportunity to deepen that foundation to rely upon Him. Picture with you would many times as a, most of us has probably never seen a a bald eagle pushing this little one out of the nest for the first time. Never have seen it. Oh, I've read about it and seen accounts about it. How that mother over the course of time when the baby is first hatched and the eagle, the nest is so warm and comfortable and soft. But as the baby grows, she begins to disturb the nest and there's more pointed, more sticks. And after a while, the nest is so uncomfortable. She's trying to make it so uncomfortable for her little eagle that it has to get out of the nest and learn to fly. God sometimes is like that. We get so comfortable. I get so comfortable in just every day-to-day -day life. And God says, you haven't exercised that foundation of trust for a while. Oh, you've been with me. You've been praying. You've been singing. But then he begins to force us out of our, out of that little, we've heard it say, force us out of our comfort zone. God wants each and every one to fully depend upon Him. Not again, not as a blind, just walking in the blind. Oh, I'm just depending on God for whatever. Everyone here and everyone that knows me knows what I think about of a GPS. <laughs> following God is like following a bad GPS. All they'll give you, unless you ask, is the next turn. Many times in life, we want to know two or three turns ahead. Where's this route taking me, Lord? Most of the time, he'll never answer that question. Because he knows that there's a den of lions waiting for you. He knows that there's some trials ahead, sickness and hurt. He knows that your journey of faith, most of the time, is only enough breath for one step at a time. If you have the faith just for that next step, that's all God asks. And while we don't know what next step we're on, I know that the steps and the turns that are ahead, the turns that are ahead for this congregation in the year 2021, I know there'll be some fear, some anxiety, 
I know there'll be some pain, some joy. But I know one thing. I know there's freedom when that foundation is anchored upon a man called Jesus. Now that doesn't mean there's not going to be some pain. It doesn't mean there's not going to be some failures. You see, we must embrace as the uncertainty as part of God has given us opportunity to exercise that muscle of trust. You see, God has given to most just enough light to see the next step. Just enough hope to stand where you are today. He'll not always show us, and most of the time He won't. Lay out the whole entire journey for our inspection. Most of the time, it's just take the next step. You see, trust, the foundation is just dependent upon someone, excuse me, other than ourselves. We live in a society today that says dependent on others is a weakness. We live in a society that belittles someone who says they can't. You see, we live in a society that thinks that trust is like a maverick, that you're going your own way, or maybe like Captain America, where you're, you just have control of everything. And our teenagers and our children, even in cartoons, they, they see all this stuff that they can do anything. I heard uh, on the, <coughs> the media here, I believe it was over Christmas that one little teenager says, I can, if I set my mind to it, I can be anything. No, you can't. And that's not belittling her. You can't take an animal that is the lowest of the crop and take it to the fair and get a gold ribbon for her. Or blue ribbon. It just can't happen. So in our minds, we think we can just will ourselves. And we fail on that dependence on God. You see, dependent on God is not the absence of strength. Dependent on God is that presence of courage deep within us. Dependent on God is like when you're riding a bike and you come to a hill and God just moves you right on up to the top. It takes courage to admit we're inadequate to make the next step. It takes courage to admit that just one step at a time, Lord, when the end is not in sight, it takes courage. It requires to move forward in the face of uncertainty. You see, there's two pages that 2021 is going to show for us. One page is a worldview. You're the ultimate master of yourself. Just believe within yourself. Just believe that you can accomplish. Just believe of your own resources. Just believe in all that is around us. And the other one, not even close to a worldview. Just believe in your soul that God's still in control. All the den might be just around the corner, but he's not showing it to us yet. Oh, we might have good talents that God's given to us. We have opportunity. But through our own strength, we do need to do what God has given to us. Use our talents that he's given to us. But he gave us that ultimate provisions of God. It all goes back to the Psalms and to Isaiah. I will lift my eyes into the hills. From where will my help come? My help will come from heaven. If I believe the creator of earth is watching over me. And I believe everyone here believes that. If I am forced 
to rely upon God's power and his provisions. You see, then I'm operating on that reliable foundation of the truth of living God. And let us never make the mistake of thinking that trust is simply a state of mind. Never make this mistake of thinking that trust is just that, just that simple positive thinking. You can just will yourself to the next stage. You see, many times in life we make the mistake, and I used to make the mistake of thinking that, well, if I'm a Christian and if I'm following God and I'm doing what the Bible says and I'm reading it and praying and doing all this, there's absolutely no way that I would ever get anything. Because I love God and God loves me, but I fail to remember that there's also no way that God's not going to allow me to go through great pains and great suffering to draw closer to Him. That's one of the places that many Christians get it so wrong. We got that thinking that God's going to carry me over. No. Sometimes we even get a ruthless trust. Doesn't matter what, Lord, I'm still trusting. But you failed in one way or the other to know. Sometimes that trust will lead us to one of the greatest trials of our life. I know that God is loving and I know that God is trustworthy. But I also know there's lion's dens awaiting the year ahead. There have been plenty of times in my life where doubt is as a rose, trusting God's goodness, but having been hurt quite a lot over the last few years, I've learned and we've learned as a body of Christ, trust goes deeper than pleasure. It goes deeper than pain. Trust embraces the lion's den. Trust Embraces the A king. Back the third king since Nebuchadnezzar. This is where we need to be. The God whom you serve continually is able to rescue you each and every day. Next week, the word willing. We might actually make it to the dead. May God preserve us. May God allow us to believe. But if heartbreak comes to our lives, the foundation of trust is when we know that we'll have enough strength to endure the substance of the life. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that in moments such as this that we are reminded of who you are, Lord. You're still God. And as another year on the calendar is about to be turned, Lord, you don't have a calendar. You don't have a clock. Lord, time is not even in you. But thank you, Lord, that you allow us the opportunity just to follow Jesus one step at a time. In Christ's name we pray.